We are continuing a series here at Cross Connection in the book of Ephesians called Identity. We're considering who we were before Christ, who we are in Christ, where we will be, our destiny with Christ, and now we're talking about how we can be what God has called us to be right now, to fulfill the purpose that God has given to us. So open with us to Ephesians chapter 4 and 5 and follow along. Thanks. It was the hit blockbuster movie of the Christmas season in 1991, in which the late comedian Robin Williams played Peter Banning, a corporate lawyer who was completely absorbed with his job and as a result had forgotten his true identity. You see, Peter Banning, his true identity was Peter Pan. And now in the movie, he finds himself going back to Neverland to rescue his two children, Maggie and Jack, who've been kidnapped by his nemesis, Captain Hook. You guys remember the movie Hook? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And in the first meeting of Peter Banning and Captain Hook, after Pan is all grown up, it's on the deck of the Jolly Roger that his two kids are lifted up high above the deck and Hook says to him, I'll make you a deal, Mr. Chairman of the board. You just fly up there and touch the outstretched fingers of your frighted children and I'll let them go. And Banning looks at him with this incredulous look and says, I can't fly because he's forgotten his true identity. He doesn't realize that he once could fly. And so he's in that place of not only can he not fly, but he whispers in the ear of, Dustin Hoffman, who plays Captain Hook perfectly in that movie, not only can he not fly, but he says, I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid of heights. It's just a few days later in the movie that Banning realizes his true identity, and now Peter Pan flies high, no longer afraid of heights, no longer fearful of flying. He does what he thought was utterly impossible. In our last study together in Ephesians, we considered... Together, as we're doing this study called Identity, this series called Identity, we considered what I referred to as the ethical responsibility of the Christian, what we should do for those who have found themselves in Christ. They, they realize their true identity. They understand their I am, that they are in Christ. And when they come to grasp that true identity, that understanding, they realize who they were before that that they were dead in trespasses and sins, that previously they lived in open opposition and disobedience to God. They were enemies of God, and as a result, they were under his wrath. That's who they were, but now they're in Christ. And now because they're in Christ, they have not only a new identity, but a new destiny. They realize that their new destiny is to be with God in eternity, that they have an inheritance that is incorruptible, that fades not away. And so, in Christ, we're dead in trespass and sins, shall be with the Lord for eternity. And as a result of being in that position, being in Christ, we have a new responsibility. So, in our study last time in Ephesians chapter 4, we considered together what we should be. I should be what? Well, he, he says in chapter 4, verse 17, that we should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles. We should no longer walk as the rest of the world, the way that we used to walk. Well, how did we walk? Well, he says that we used to walk in the futility of our minds. We used to walk in vanity because our understanding was darkened. We were separated from God by ignorance and by blindness, and we were fully engaged in lewd and unclean behavior, things that were in open opposition to God. And so he says, you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles, but he says in chapter 4, verse 1, that you should walk worthy of the calling wherewith you've been called. And so he describes the walk that we should be walking in now, that we should be walking a walk that is characterized by humility, that's characterized by meekness or gentleness, that's characterized by patience and forgiveness, forgiving others as we ourselves have been forgiven of God. So this is the ethical responsibility of the Christian. The person whose identity is in Christ, they should walk in this manner, in humility and gentleness and meekness and forgiveness. They should no longer walk as they once did before. If you're a Christian by grace through faith, then your life should be different. Point number one on your sermon guide, if you have it there, it's in your bulletin. 
Point number one is, if your identity is in Christ, then your way of life should be different. It's pretty simple. If your identity is in Christ, then your way of life should be different. He or she that is in Christ ought to be Christ-like in their conduct. The way that we live should be seen by people who don't know the Lord. They should be able to identify and recognize that that person is different because of the way that they respond to other people, the way that they talk, the way that they live their lives. It should be very, very evident that we are different. We should no longer be as we once were. And the identity that we are to have in Christ is very, very specific and practical. Paul in chapter 4 and going on into chapter 5, we didn't get time to go and look through all of it last week, but we're going to today. He gets into some of the specific practicalities of what does it look like to be a person who is characterized by the likeness of Christ in their life. So if you would open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, near the end of your Bibles, if you're new to the Bible, right after the books of First and Second Corinthians in the New Testament, and then Galatians, and this small six-chapter book called Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, would you stand with me, please? And we're going to begin reading at verse 17, because in Ephesians 4, verses 17 through the end of chapter 4, and a few verses in chapter 5, Paul gets very, very specific on the practicalities. What does it look like to be a person whose life is characterized by the likeness of Christ? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul writes this. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you... Have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, Let each one of you speak truth to his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who is in need. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you all with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ Jesus forgave you. Then look at chapter 5, verse 3. But fornication and uncleanness, covetousness, Let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers of with them. Now skip down to verse 11, Ephesians 5 verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Father, we have a a heavy passage of scripture here before us, Lord. The practicalities, the specifics of what it looks like to be a person that is walking in Christ-like conduct with Christ-like character. Lord, these things are crystal clear. They, they couldn't be any more practical. And I pray, God, that you would help us to be able to apply these things in our lives. 
Lord, help us to walk in a way that would be honoring and glorifying to you. And we ask that by your spirit and by the work of your word that you would transform us today. Make us more like you. And if there's any here today who they have not yet put their faith in you, Lord, I pray that you by your spirit would draw them. Draw them into a place where they, they confess their sin to you and receive your gracious gift. Lord, we pray that we would be a people that are set apart, but in a way not that we're uh, prideful or arrogant or trying to keep away from people that need you, but Lord, that we'd be set apart in a way that we honor and glorify you with these bodies that you've created, Lord, that they would be instruments of worship. So transform us, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I don't think that you could get any more clear and practical than what Paul does here in this passage. As he says, this is what the Christian should be. This is what they should look like in their conduct. When he says that we are holy and blameless, this is what holy and blameless looks like. Now, a lot of times when people talk about being holy, they think about very religious, ritualistic holiness, that they go to church and they pray and they do some form of ritual to try and make them holy. But what Paul talks about here is very practical, street level, you know, on the street Christianity. He says, if you're a Christian, if your identity is found in Christ, in verse 25 of chapter 4, he says, stop lying and speak the truth. It doesn't get any clearer than that. If you're a Christian, don't tell lies, tell the truth. He goes on in verse 26. If you're a Christian, be angry, but don't sin. God recognizes that one of the emotional responses within us, you can't stop us from responding in this way. When we see terrible, wicked things, when we see unjust things happen, we're going to be angry. But he says, be angry, but don't sin. You know, a lot of people think that Christians are never supposed to be angry. No, be angry, but don't sin. Well, how do I do that? Well, be angry for the right reasons and respond in the right way. That's what it means to be angry and don't sin. He adds to it, he says, don't let anger linger. That's a problem that we all have, isn't it? He says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. If you're mad, don't let it stay there. Don't let it build up and well up inside of you, dwelling upon it in the wrong way. So be angry, but don't sin. He goes on in verse 28. This may be one of my favorite. Verse 28 of chapter 4. Very clearly, if I could speak it in a different, easier sort of way, he just says, stop stealing, get a job, and give. That, that's what he says. If you're a thief, don't steal anymore. Get a job, and then give to people who have need. And so if, if that's your problem, stop it. He goes on in, in verses 29 and 30. Don't use foul language, but instead speak gracious words that lift people up. It's pretty simple. If you've got a problem with a foul mouth, stop it. Don't do that anymore. You're a Christian. Don't do that. Don't let corrupt language proceed out of your mouth. Why? He gives us a reason. He says, if you do, if you're a Christian today and you let corrupt language proceed out of your mouth, it's grieving to God. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So how is corrupt language grieving to God? Well, I think one of the ways is this. Jesus says that it's out of the heart that precede those evil sort of things. So if you have corrupt language coming out of your mouth, then it originated in your heart. And if you're a Christian, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tell us that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of God dwells in you and your corruptness is crowding him out if your foul language is coming out because that's in your heart. And that upsets him. It grieves him. And so he says, corrupt language, don't, don't do that any longer. He gets even more practical. Verses 31 and 32 of this passage in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, if you're a Christian, then get rid of bitterness. Put away bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. Clamor is arguing with one another. Put those things away. That's not supposed to be a part of your life. Get rid of evil speaking, kind of linked to corrupt language, and get rid of malice. If you're a Christian, there should be no malice in your heart. You go, well, what's malice? We don't really use that word very much anymore. Malice is having ill intent towards someone, wishing someone else harm. None of us have ever done that, right? I wish that person would, you know, fill in the blank. Whatever it may be. Someone cuts you off on the freeway and you wish them harm. You ever have that happen on the 15, going to work in the morning? Be honest. We all have. So, so if there's malice, he says, get rid of that. Put it away. And in its place, replace it with three things he gives us in verse 32. Kindness, tenderheartedness, and forgiveness. As Christ has forgiven you. 
In the same way he's forgiven you, you're to forgive other people, to pardon them when they do something that is in offense to you. He goes on in chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. He says that the Christian who's identified in Christ, they should not be involved in these six things. Fornication, which is sexual immorality of any kind, uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talking, and coarse jesting. Point number two on your outline. We are called to a practical holiness. We are called to a practical holiness, not just a religious ritual. Christians are called to a practical holiness, not just a religious ritual. Now, I recognize we live in a culture and we go to a church that, you know, sometimes prides itself on being non-traditional. Maybe you came out of a more traditional and liturgical aspect of Christianity. You, You know, the Christian tent is really big. And there's a lot of different bodies within the Christian tent. We're all one body in Christ, but there's all kinds of different personalities, if you will, within this. And so you have some that are more ritualistic and more liturgical. And some of you came out of that background where there were sacraments and there was a lot of standing up, kneeling down, and genuflecting and that sort of stuff. So we're in a side of the tent that's non-traditional. I I like to say we're traditionally non-traditional because we still have traditions, We still do certain things kind of ritualistically and we get into these sort of things and we we put a lot of weight in them that we have to do it this way. But that's not what makes us holy, those rituals. And, And those rituals may not be a bad thing. Partaking of communion, being baptized, praying at certain times before meals, those things that become a pattern in our life, they're good things. They're not necessarily a bad thing. However, that is not the only thing that Christianity is about. Christianity is a practical way of living. And so God has called us to a practical holiness. The Bible commends, constantly commends practical holiness because the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Back in the Old Testament, in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, there is this discourse between the first king of the nation of Israel, a guy by the name of Saul, And the man who was the judge or the prophet of the nation at that time, a guy by the name of Samuel. And Samuel, in that discourse, that discussion with King Saul, he says this in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. You you see, it's something about our nature that really likes religious ritual. Religious ritual, sacrificing things, doing physical acts of penance, praying prayers to try and atone for something. Those things give us some sort of tangible thing that we can hold on to and we can say, see, I did this. And because I gave this or because I did this, that makes me right. That makes me better. And and you know, those things, like I said, they might be good things, but what we're told here is that God delights more in our obedience. He delights more in us walking out our faith. King Solomon, the third king of the nation of Israel, he wrote the book of Proverbs, a very wise man, and he writes this, Proverbs 21, verse 3, King Solomon says, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. He's calling us to do justice and righteousness. Micah, one of the prophets to the nation of Israel, he says in Micah chapter 6, He, God, has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice, to love mercy and to walk in humility. This is what God is looking for from our lives, that we do justly. We walk out righteousness. In the New Testament, the apostle Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, He writes this in verses 15 and 16. But as he, God, who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Not just your conduct on Sunday morning from the hours of 8.30 till 10 o'clock. Be holy in all of your conduct. Verse 16, he says, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. God is holy and he calls us to holiness. Now, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, then you probably know these verses and you probably know a whole bunch of others just like them. And you probably even have an inner desire as a Christian to do these things. 
There's a compulsion within you that, that came when you put your faith in Christ. You had a new desire, and that desire was to be holy. That desire was to obey. But if you've tried to be practically holy, then you know it's about as easy as Peter Banning flying up and touching the outstretched fingers of his, his frighted children. When God says, be holy, for I am holy, you kind of stand there on the deck of the Jolly Roger sheepishly saying, I, I can't fly. I can't do that. And you probably know in your own experience that all you, though you should be these things, you recognize that in many ways you're not. And so you find yourself mirroring the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 19, where he says, for the good that I want to do, I don't do. And the bad things I don't want to do, that's what I practice. Many people find themselves in that place. The good that I want to do, I don't do. And the bad things that I don't want to do, that's exactly what I find myself doing. I know my identity. I am in Christ. I know that I was dead in trespasses and sins, that I was under his wrath as a child of disobedience. I know that I will be with him in the future. My destiny is set there with him in eternity. But right now, my purpose, my should be, I kind of struggle with that. I have a hard time working those things out. I know that I'm supposed to. I know that I should be. But how to do that, I don't know. And I'm here to tell you this morning that your should be is actually a can be. Your should be is actually a can be. I can be what God has called me to be in walking these things out. Now, of course, the immediate question is how? How can I do that? And, and I suggest that the answer to that question is found here in this book, in the book of Ephesians. It's found in other places in the New Testament throughout the scriptures, but we, we see some answers to this question here in the book of Ephesians. One of them is found in a verse we've hit on every single week in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And from this verse and others that we'll see today, this point becomes clear. If he, or point number three on your outline. His grace enables my obedience. His grace enables my obedience. We constantly need to come back to this reality that His grace enables my obedience. And, and I think that one of the responses to that point that I've heard from people in varying ways over the years when I, when I share that truth that His grace enables us to obey Him is, so wait, are you saying that I don't have to do anything and that God is going to do everything? And to that question, I say, no. And yes. No and yes. Now, that may seem kind of like a Christian schizophrenia, but there's truth to it. You know, well, how does that work? How does that work? Well, to answer that, I want you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to look at two stories from Jesus' life. The Gospel of Luke is the third book of the New Testament, right after Matthew and Mark, just before the book of John. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 17. Luke records the life of Jesus, and he talks about some significant events from Jesus' life and ministry during his three years ministering here on the earth. We read about this in Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day, as Jesus was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by. Quick little sideline. Pharisees were hyper, hyper religious people. Think of the most religious person you can imagine. That's the Pharisees. And so there were Pharisees and teachers of the law of Moses, the law of God, there sitting by as he was teaching. And they had come out of every town in Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before Jesus. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on top of the housetop and they let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst of the people before Jesus. 
This is awesome. Jesus is in a room and it's so crowded that you can't even get in. And all these people are listening to what Jesus has to say. And they're present in the crowd as the most religious people of the day. They're not there because they're really interested in Jesus and following him. They're there because they're trying to trick him and trip him up. And they're trying to find anything that they can do to remove him because he's like a vacuum pulling the people towards him away from them. And they don't like that. And so the power is shifting in the nation, the religious part of the nation in that day, and they don't like it. So they're all crowded in. And here these guys come with a genuine problem. You got all these people that are there trying to trip Jesus up, but here's a guy who's got a genuine issue. He's paralyzed. He can't move. He's in such a dire situation. He's got four guys carrying him to Jesus on a bed, on a stretcher. And they come in and they're looking around and they can't get in. They can't bring the truly needy to Jesus because the religious are crowding around him. Sound familiar? And so they go up on the rooftop. These guys are ingenious. They carry this guy on the rooftop and they find a way. Let's just just break into this roof and we're going to lower this guy down to Jesus. These guys are determined to get him to Jesus. Apparently, they think Jesus can do something about this situation. So they lower him down to Jesus. And so now here is this situation. I mean, imagine all these people are listening to Jesus teach. And this, if this is ever a distraction, I mean, you think a cell phone ringing in the service is a distraction. This is a distraction. Guy comes lowered down from the ceiling. He's got a problem right there before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said to the man, man, your sins are forgiven you. Well, wait a minute. He, he can't walk. That's not exactly the issue, is it? Apparently, Jesus thinks it is. And the scribes and the Pharisees, the hyper-religious, they began to reason, they're thinking, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, their theology is right. The application of their theology as it relates to Jesus is wrong. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, tells us a little something about Jesus. We're going to be talking about Jesus this week on Tuesday night. Come on out, men's ministry, women's ministry. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts... He answered their thoughts and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or rather, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately he rose before them all, took up his bed that he had been lying on, And he departed to his own house, glorifying God. And all those that were there were amazed, and they glorified God and are filled with fear, saying, we have seen some strange things today. Yes, you have. Turn to page, one page, chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 6. Now it happened on another Sabbath, a Saturday, when they would gather together for worship, It happened on another Sabbath also that he entered into a synagogue, a church basically, and he taught. And the man was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and the Pharisees, the doctors of the law and the hyper-religious, they were there. They watched Jesus closely, whether he would heal this man on the Sabbath, because in their book, you can't do that. You can't do any work on the Sabbath day, and that apparently would be work for Jesus, which really it's not. But there's this man with a withered hand. The religious are keeping the truly needy from getting to Jesus. Again, sound familiar? And so the scribes and the Pharisees watched Jesus closely, wanting to see if he'll heal on the Sabbath, that they might find accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts. He said to the man who had a withered hand, Arise, stand. And he arose and he stood, and Jesus said to him, I will ask you one thing, speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were all filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Why do I highlight these two stories from Jesus' life in the Gospel of Luke? In answering the question of, are you saying that I don't have to do anything and God does everything? Yes and no. Because notice, here is a man who has no ability by himself to get up, take up his bed, and walk. He's paralyzed. He is inoperable. He can't do anything. And another man whose hand is withered, he can't move it. It's not like the other hand, and it's all crippled. And Jesus gives both of these guys commands. He commands the man who is paralyzed, get up, take up your bed, and walk. He commands him to do something that he has no power to do. And yet the man does it. 
He commands the man with the withered hand to stretch forth his hand. No doubt many times in his life, he had probably tried to stretch forth his hand with no ability to do so. And now Jesus commands him, stretch forth your hand. And in that moment, he stretches it forth. What's happening here? Well, I would suggest to you that with Jesus' command came the enabling power to fulfill it. But see, Jesus is working, but these guys need to obey the command. They need to take the initiative and begin to sit up. They need to take the initiative beyond all the other things that are telling them it's impossible. I can't do that. They need to take the initiative of faith and stretch forth the hand and rise up and walk. With the command of Jesus comes the enabling power to fulfill the command. He, by his grace, has saved us apart from our works, but he has saved us unto good works. And we should walk in those things. He has commanded us to put away lying and stealing, to put away corrupt communication and bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. He's commanded us to not be sexually immoral. He's commanded us to not be clean. He's commanded us to be tenderhearted and gentle and meek and humble and forgiving. None of those things we have the ability in and of ourselves to accomplish. We've all tried to do those things unsuccessfully time and time again. But he still commanded us to do that. So you say, well, how on earth can we walk in these things? Well, if you noticed when we were reading some verses earlier in Ephesians chapter 5, I skipped some verses on purpose. And so go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verses 1 and 2 first. Paul the Apostle, after he has told the church at Ephesus, In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, to walk worthy of the calling wherewith they've been called, he now says this, 5 verse 1, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us as an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now skip down to verse 8. For you, Ephesians 5, 8, were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk... As children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of God's Spirit in us, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Now, that's the New King James translation, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. I don't really like that translation because those words finding out should rather be proving what is the acceptable, what is acceptable to the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit in our lives produces goodness, righteousness, and truth and proves what is acceptable to the Lord. Now skip down to verse 14, Ephesians 5, 14. Therefore, he says, awake, wake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you, what? Say it loud. Walk. Third time, that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, immediately following those verses in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul directs his attention to specific groups of people. He speaks to husbands and wives. He speaks to masters and slaves or employers and employees in our modern day. He speaks to children. He tells all these different classifications of people how they are to live. Interestingly, embedded in the text about husbands and wives, he says this, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her, the church, with the washing of the water by the what? By the word. Point number four on your outline. Practical holiness is a balance of his work and ours. Practical holiness is a balance of his work and ours. The uh, question is, how much of a balance? Is it like 40% his work, 60% ours? Or is it 25% our work, 75% ours? Is it 50-50? I don't know. 
But I do know that the scriptures reveal that walking out this walk in Christ is a balance of his work and ours. And probably the best verse that illustrates this, not the only verse, but the best one that illustrates it, is found in the book of Philippians. It's one book to the right of Ephesians. Philippians chapter 2. Look at Philippians chapter 2 for just a moment. We're going to look at two verses, verses 12 and 13. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. Same author as the book of Ephesians. The Apostle Paul writes this, Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my beloved, speaking to the church that existed in the city of Philippi, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, done the right thing, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, you obeyed when I was there and you're still obeying even though I'm not watching over your shoulder and making sure you're obeying. I mean, that would be helpful to have an apostle watching you all the time, making sure you obeyed, but he's not there any longer. He says, you're still obeying, I'm not there. Now, since you obeyed when I was there and since you've obeyed since I've not been there, he says this. Look at the end of verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. Walk out your Christian life with fear and trembling, with actual energy engaged in this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Then look at verse 13 and remember the verse changes were not there originally. This was just the continuation. It's the same sentence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, semicolon, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do, to do his good pleasure. Another English translation says, it is God who works in you to desire and to do what is good to him, what is pleasing to him. So who's working? Is it God or is it you? Yes, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for God is working in you to give you the desire to do it and the ability to do it, those things that make him happy, that bring him pleasure. He is working and we are working. So what's the balance here? Well, I don't know, but we do know that he is keeping up his end of the bargain. Right? How do we know that? Well, Scripture tells us for one, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So what's it telling us? He's keeping up his end of the bargain. So the question is, are we working out our salvation with fear and trembling, or are we just sitting back and going, if he wants me to change, he's going to have to come in here and change it. If he wants this to go away in my life, then he's going to have to come and take it away. And you know what? Sadly, a lot of Christians live like that, and they live a defeated life for 20, 30, 40 years. Their entire lives, they live as infants in Christ. They never grow to maturity in Christ because they're just going, well, if he wants to fix me, I'm here in church. Come on now. And so he's working. And I would suggest he's saying, rise, take up your bed and walk. You're going, I can't do that. He's going, no, I, I commanded you, and with the command, I give you the enabling power to do it. I'm certain that he's keeping up his end of the deal. He's not failing. And so I would suggest that these verses that we read here in Ephesians chapter 5, they give us some important clues as to how these things come to be in our lives. And I'd sum it up this way, point number five. Point number five. How does this become a reality in my life and in yours? Point number five. Be saturated by the Spirit and be sanctified by the scriptures, and you will soar. Be saturated by the spirit, and sanctified by the scriptures, and you will soar. There's some nice alliteration there to help you remember it. Be saturated by the spirit, and sanctified by the scriptures, and you will soar like Peter Pan, who did the impossible. Why? How? Because there's this great passage in Luke chapter 1, where Jesus is interacting with some people who are some lacking faith. And they're going, can God really do these things that you're talking about? And the angel says this in Luke 1 37, for with God, nothing will be impossible. With God, nothing will be impossible. Then to kind of drive it home, because we think, well, God is limited by the same limitations that I'm limited by. Later on in the gospel of Luke, it's also recorded in Matthew and Mark, we find in Luke chapter 18, verse 27, the things which are impossible with man are possible with God. So he is able to enable you and I to do the things that he's called us to do. And if you're falling and not flying, then I would suggest that maybe it's time for you to say, God, would you 
Fill me, refill me, enable me, help me to recognize your enabling power by your spirit in my life. Because I see in Ephesians chapter 5 that the evidence of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit in my life, Ephesians chapter 5 says, is all those things that are acceptable to God. In Galatians chapter 5, we read there that the evidence of the Spirit of God in my life is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, all of those good things. So, God, would you help me to recognize your power by your Spirit in my life? And then I would suggest the next thing you need to do if you're falling and not flying is that you need to actually test whether or not the Scriptures are true when it says that he sanctifies us by the washing of the water by his word. When Jesus prays in John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. You need to test and see whether or not God's word has the ability that the Bible says that it does to transform you by the renewing of your mind. And so I would suggest that maybe you need to spend some more time studying the word of God, reading the word of God, meditating upon the word of God, memorizing the word of God, and doing the word of God. You see, I have found that just about every time I sit down with a believer who says, I'm living a defeated life, they may not say it that way, but that's what they're saying. They cannot conquer some sin that has conquered them, some sin that so easily ensnares them, anger, drunkenness, immorality, pornography, whatever it may be. They're being tripped up by the sin. As I talk with them and they share with me that they're a believer, they put their faith in Christ, they say, let me ask you a really simple question. How often do you read the Bible? Well, I come to church. That's, that's akin with saying, God, I'm here. You better just fix me. He's going, listen, I've given you my word, which is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. By it, I cleanse you. And it sits there and you never apply it in any way. Now, unfortunately, the word of God does not work by osmosis. So you leaving it on the nightstand next to your bed is not sufficient. And this is not the matrix. They're not going to plug something into your head and boom, it's uploaded in five seconds and you know Kung Fu. It doesn't work that way. It's time to say, he has commanded me to stretch forth my hand and say, okay, I by faith am going to begin to apply your word. David, the king, in Psalm 119, he says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word is a light into my path, a lamp into my feet. It's that which guides and directs the life of the Christian. And if you're living a life that is not soaring, but actually falling constantly, being easily ensnared by sin, I would say that it has a lot to do with the fact that you're not taking hold of the Word of God and allowing it to take hold of you. And so there's a balance, His work and yours. And I'm here to tell you that the should-bes of the Bible are can-bes for the Christian because He's enabled you to do it by His power. He's given us his spirit, and he's given us the scriptures, and by them we are transformed. So in just a month, on the 21st of March, we're going to have a how to read the Bible with purpose class. It's one day, it's three hours on a Saturday morning, the 21st. I sent it out in the email that I sent out a couple days ago. There's a, there are a link, there'll be a link on the website to sign up for it if you want to be a part. of it. It's free, three hours, how to study the Bible with purpose. And I challenge you, if you're being tripped up by sin and you're not seeing victory in your life as a Christian, he is faithful to complete the work he started. But he's called us to do some things. And the should-bes of the Bible can become the can-bes. And next week in Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to get into the task of the Christian, which is, I fight to be. I'm in Christ. I was dead in trespasses and sins. I'm going to be with him in eternity in heaven. I should be holy and blameless and walk worthy of the calling with which I can. I can be, therefore, I fight to be that. Ephesians chapter 6. Hope to see you next week. Let's stand and pray. God, thank you for your word. It is living and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, by it, your servant is warned. Through it, you transform us and cleanse us and clean us and make us new. And God, I pray that our lives would so illustrate 
your grace and your goodness, that our lives in us would be seen, that we are walking in a way that is pleasing to you, not that we would be glorified, not that we would be arrogant and puffed up because that would be sin, but that you would be glorified and people would say, they have a good God who is real. God, I pray that your reality, who you are, would be seen in our lives today and this week. For we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.